Hello YouTube, CyberCDH here. Hope you're doing really well. Today we're going to talk about Emotep and the fact that it's been taken down and taken over by European law enforcement agencies recently and what that means for us in the security community. So let's get going. Okay, so as some background, on 27th of Jan 2021, European law enforcement announced that they'd taken control and seized control over the infrastructure behind Emotet malware, which is often described as the world's most dangerous piece of malware and has been prevalent for the best part of the last decade, um, responsible for approximately $2 billion in losses, although that's probably a really conservative estimate. It's also widely reported there are currently about a million devices currently infected with malware as a result of Emotet infections. And the operation to investigate this crime and to take down the infrastructure was a coordinated effort between agencies in the Netherlands, Germany, the US, the UK, France, Lithuania, Canada and the Ukraine, all brought together by Europol and Eurojust, the European Agency for Criminal Justice Cooperation, a monumental effort to bring together all of these jurisdictions to investigate a global crime which has been wreaking havoc amongst the security communities for the best part of the past decade. The infrastructure behind Emotet operated across many hundreds of servers worldwide, and they would be responsible for infecting new victims, also serving different malware variants from other organized criminal groups, and just to basically be a very highly sophisticated, resilient network against takedown operations such as these as well. So let's rewind a little bit, talk about what Emotet is and how it all started. Well, it started life in 2014 as a banking Trojan, and Trojans are pieces of malware which disguise themselves as legitimate pieces of software. And banking Trojans in particular will aim to steal your financial information by usually intercepting your web traffic when you're carrying out your financial transactions, that kind of thing. And by August 2017, what was interesting is that Emotet started dropping additional malware onto victim computers. And in particular, it would drop the Drydex banking Trojan. And it wasn't really that new for one malware author to be dropping an additional piece of malware, but it was quite new for having two adversaries, both involved in the development of sophisticated banking Trojans, to be working closely together. And it kind of signified the business model that Emotet would really take forward where it would act as a primary door opener to load other pieces of malware from other organized criminal groups who are specialist in different types of exploitation. And by September 2018, Emotet adversaries had also built into their malware the capability to spread laterally across networks and across the internet, really giving Emotet some superpowers in how it infected victims. It acted primarily as, as this front end door opener for other pieces of malware in later life. It was so sophisticated how it would infect victims on such a widespread scale and they had such a high success rate in bypassing security controls to infiltrate organizations and also infiltrate home users as well. And one of the adversaries that was partnering with the Emotet adversaries was responsible for Ryak ransomware. And Ryak was a pretty nasty piece of ransomware and still about today that has infected many hundreds of healthcare organizations and hospitals around the globe as well. And it's pretty awful business model. The infrastructure behind Emotet as well was pretty sophisticated. If you became infected with this malware, you'd become part of their botnet and you would potentially infect other victims as well, unbeknownst to you. These botnets were actually called Epoch 1, 2 and 3. And so you would form part of one of these botnets and they would use their own cryptographic keys to communicate back to the command and control servers as part of these botnets to protect all of the information that was traveling back and forth between the server and the victim. And in fact, they would use their own AES key and that in turn would be encrypted with an RSA public key. The private key is obviously only known to the Emotet adversaries. So how did Emotet adversaries become so successful at infecting so many victims? Well, firstly, they took email infection to a new level. They used a highly sophisticated automated process to distribute their malicious campaigns to hundreds and thousands of recipients every single day. And they used to use links and emails that would lead to the download of a file, but most commonly they would use a malicious Word doc attachment, which would have malicious macros embedded to further download some code. 
And they would use a variety of lures or enticements to have victims click on these links or open these attachments. And they were really good at keeping up to speed with current affairs. And so we'd see invoice and payment themed emails over Christmas, that kind of thing. And also more recently, we'd see a lot of lures related to COVID-19 as well. Also, a fairly recent update to Emotet modular nature was that they would actually steal emails from infected victims and also email attachments and then they would use those email threads back against subsequent victims to make their phishing emails even more convincing and once a file is opened a victim would be prompted to enable macros in the document itself and the macro code was heavily obfuscated and so that was designed to evade both security controls, automated sandboxes, that kind of thing, but also human analysis as well, making it extremely difficult to analyze and determine how the infection vector was taking place. They'd also use constantly changing tactics. And so you might build a signature or a method to automatically analyze these particular files, but the following day, the following week, they would switch up their tactics. They'd use a completely different infection method and your detection mechanisms would be null and void. And it also became a signature of Emotet infections that they would have five payload URLs embedded into their macro code. And these URLs would basically act as fallbacks in case one URL was subsequently taken down and they would host their malicious content, the second stage malware on these payload URLs. And quite often, more often than not, these URLs were compromised websites themselves, which would again, save the bad guys from having to stand up their own infrastructure, but also probably evade security controls because they were compromising relatively benign websites. So after the macros have got to work and pull down this initial code, the first thing that Emotet would do is to check to see whether it has administrative privileges or not and determine which method it's going to use to remain persistent on the underlying victim. And it used two methods of persistence primarily. The first being if it was an admin, it would create a service and therefore every time the machine booted, the service would load from System32 or the SysWile64 folder. Uh, or alternatively, if this was a user with standard privileges, they would store an executable in a temp directory and reference that in a very common registry location, which again would start the malware at each reboot. It would then get to work and profile the underlying victim and it would send information back to its command and control servers, namely host name and process information. And it would store this encrypted data in the body of post requests or previously a few years ago, they would actually use encrypted cookie values in get request parameters as well. And this data was encrypted, as I said earlier, with an AES session key and that session key itself would then be encrypted with an RSA public key. And the response from the C2 command and control servers would be further instructions, further commands to run, or more likely further malware to install. And quite often this would be the TrickBot info stealer or even Ryuk ransomware as well. To make matters worse, the Emotet binaries were usually packed and malware authors will pack their code to protect both sandboxes and automated analysis techniques from understanding the true nature of the malware also make it difficult for us as security analysts to analyze as well. And they would also use a customized packer and quite often their techniques for packing would change as well, defeating any automated means of unpacking this code. If you did manage to unpack it though, you would get to the config and the config itself would often contain up to 60 IP addresses of the command and control servers that the malware was designed to talk back to. Just shows you the kind of scale of operation from one single victim here. And really, I can only admire the work from law enforcement to analyze all of these samples and analyze all of this global infrastructure and pull together all of the relevant jurisdictions to get to the place where they can actually identify the adversaries behind this malware and take down this operation. So whilst this takedown represents a huge win for law enforcement, I definitely not the end for organized criminal groups and all of the other malware variants that are out there operating and infecting devices on a daily basis. And in fact, I think actually what we'll see here is a 
kickstart of a process where the major criminal operations will start to harden their environment to really double down on their own operational security to try and avoid detection and takedown like we've seen from this enormous coordinated effort. The bad guys here are financially motivated invariably and so they have this ability to pump huge sums of money back into their own infrastructure to avoid detection, avoid takedown and continuously change their modus of operandi. So we as end users, well, we should definitely be on our guard as we always should do in respect of any emails or text messages or social media messages that come our way with a degree of urgency that encourage us to part with our information, our data, our privacy and click a link or open a file. We should definitely be on our guard and be aware of how you can report such suspicious behavior as well. For organizations, we should definitely continue to mature the perimeter controls that we have the network-based controls on the inside, and also the host-based detection mechanisms as well that really focus on behavioral detection as opposed to a signature-based approach, which bad guys are so well-schooled at avoiding nowadays. Finally as well, a good point to finish on is that the Dutch authorities have actually released an online tool where you can check if your email address was ever part of the email tech infrastructure, if you were a victim, or even if the bad guys had actually spoofed your email account to send out malicious emails, you can go and check on their website for that kind of information. Really thank you for watching this video. I hope that you've enjoyed the content. And if you do, please give it a big thumbs up. You can also follow me on Twitter at CyberCDH and I really welcome your questions and comments. Stay healthy until next time.